We've now seen how we can use the equilibrium equation that emerges on the left-hand side of the circular flow diagram to find the equilibrium in this economy. By simply noting that in equilibrium, this equation has to hold, and then dividing that equation by one, we get that the shares of consumption, investment, government purchases, and net exports must sum to one in equilibrium. And that's only true in this row of the table. But to really appreciate how the equilibrium real interest rate emerges in the intermediate run, we have to look to the second equilibrium equation that emerges in the circular flow diagram. That second equation emerges on the right-hand side where we see financial markets. What flows into financial markets must be equal to what flows out of financial markets in equilibrium. What flows in is household savings and government savings, which together make up domestic savings. What flows out is investment and net exports. So savings, domestic savings, has to be equal to investment plus net exports in equilibrium. We can now do to this equation exactly what we did to the previous one, divided by y. And we get that the savings share of GDP has to be equal to the investment share of GDP plus the net export share of GDP in equilibrium. So now we want to create a new column in the table, the savings share of GDP. How can we use the numbers that are already in the table to come up with that column? Well, for that, we have to look to the top of the circular flow diagram and recognize that GDP can only flow in one of two directions, either to the left, where we see government purchases and consumption, or to the right, where we see government savings and household savings. In other words, domestic savings has to be equal to what's left over from GDP once we subtract out consumption and government purchases. We can then divide that equation by y to get that the savings share of GDP is equal to 1, y divided by y, minus the consumption share, minus the government purchases share. And we already have the consumption share and the government purchases share in the table. So all we have to do is subtract those from 1 to get this column. So in the first row, we say 1 minus 0.64 minus 0.2, well, that's minus that's 1 minus 0.84, which gives us 0 0.16. In the second row, we say 1 minus 0.63 minus 0.2. That's 1 minus 0.83, which leaves us with 0 0.17. And then we get 0 0.18, 0 0.19, and 0 0.2. Then we want a final column in the table, the column that represents investment plus net exports as a share of GDP. So investment plus net exports as a share of GDP. Well, we already have investment and net exports as a share of GDP in two separate columns. We just have to add those together. 0.17 plus 0.02 is equal to 0 0.19. 0 0.16 plus 0.01 is equal to 0 0.17. 0 0.15 0 0.13 and 0 0.11. Now in equilibrium, we know this equation has to hold. Where does that equation hold? Well, exactly in the line that we previously indicated, using this equation must be the equilibrium. We've previously said that if we have an equilibrium on this side of the circular flow, we must have an equilibrium on this side, and indeed that holds in our table. But more importantly, we can now draw a graph that illustrates how that equilibrium real interest rate emerges. In that graph, we're going to put the real interest rate on the vertical axis and shares of GDP on the horizontal axis. We then have two curves represented by these two columns. The saving share of GDP, which goes up as the real interest rate increases. So it's a curve like this, an upward sloping curve that says savings as a share of GDP increases as the real interest rate rises, which makes sense. As the real interest rate rises, savings pay off more, so we'd expect the share of GDP that goes to savings to go up. The second curve is going to be derived from this column, 
and it's a downward sloping curve. As the real interest rate goes up, the numbers go down. So we see a downward sloping curve that will label i plus nx divided by y. Now that looks a lot like a demand and supply graph, and that's exactly what it is. This curve represents the inflow of savings into financial markets, and that inflow increases as the real interest rate rises. It is the supply curve for savings going into financial markets. This curve represents what flows out of financial markets. As the real interest rate falls, more is demanded by the rest of the world and firms. So that becomes the demand curve. And just as in any demand and supply graph, the equilibrium price, which in this case is the equilibrium real interest rate, emerges at the intersection of supply and demand. Now before you take the quiz, I'd like you to think about one thing. Take this table that represents our economy, and suppose that the government suddenly decides to undertake a massive infrastructure program, or is engaged in a sudden massive war. And as a result, government purchases have to go up as a share of GDP. We've held those as exogenously at 0.2 so far. Suppose that the share of government savings, the share of government purchases, uh, goes up to 0.29. So if this column changes to 0.29, I want you to rewrite this table and see what changes in the table, and then use what we've done to see whether you can identify where the new equilibrium and the new equilibrium real interest rate will lie. So go ahead and write out the table, take the quiz, and we'll talk more about this in class.